The word of the Lord says this. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. And that's where I'll stop today. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, by your word, may we be led today. By your spirit, may you light the path for us. And may we hear from you during this time. Be present in our midst. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. And this could be an interesting um, ride for myself as well as you guys having to be in here with me. Um, before I came up on stage, I took my left contact out because it was just making all sorts. Of, I, I get allergies this time of year. I don't know if you guys get allergies, but I do. My eye gets pasty and stuff like that. And so it was bugging me during announcements, so I took it out. And I am really having trouble reading the words. If you saw me in my Bible, it was, I was meaning to get closer. So if I take my notes and I do this, that's about the distance I need to be to see right now. So we're going to wing it and see what happens. It could be an adventure. Um, if I misquote something or misread something, it's all because of that, not because I did it, right? No. Um, please have a little grace with me this morning. Today we're talking about this passage of Scripture, and a lot of times I like to start off my messages with, you know, illustrations and, and stories and include humor and stuff like that. And, and there's going to be a lot of illustrations. There's going to be some stories in this message today, but they're not going to be of the funny part. They're not going to be of the funny kind for the most part. And, and I know a lot of you guys look towards, towards some of the wit, some of the humor and stuff like that. Um, all I'm going to say is stick with me because this is good stuff. There's a lot of powerful stuff in our scripture today. And, and, and one aspect that we're going to be talking of repeatedly, which is repentance. But the illustration I want to start with today is, is to make you realize and to understand, I think many of us realize this, that sometimes to get to the good, you have to go through the bad. Sometimes to get through the clean, you have to go through the dirty. You have, to, you have to endure stuff and go through stuff that you don't necessarily want to to get the outcome that you're looking for or to get to a place of where you want to be. I'm going to give you two illustrations to start, both of them very serious. Both of them instances of people that I know in my life have gone through some difficult times. The first one uh, happened a, a little less than a decade ago. Um, friends of ours, they've been married 26 years. Um, three children. One of them was out of the house. Two of them were still in the house at the time. It was a day much like today. Um, maybe I think it was in October. Sunny Sunday morning after they came home from church, he sat his wife and his two children down who still lived at home, and he said, I found somebody else. I'm moving out. And then this man went on a road trip about an hour and a half to tell his oldest child the same thing, at which time they rebuked him, um, told him he was out of his mind and things of that nature. And about 10 minutes um, into the trip back from seeing his oldest uh, with his new partner, he basically had what can only be described as, as, as the, the clouds lifting, the, this moment of clarity where he thought to himself, what am I doing? What am I doing? He called his spouse and immediately said, please forgive me. I don't know what I've done. I want to come home. That night, he slept in his house. He slept in his house every night since then. His wife and him have been through this journey that can only be described from, you know, what we would figure to say the pits of hell to the highest of the highs. Because they went through counseling like you can only imagine, right? They went on retreats and things of that nature. Um, and at this point, their marriage, they would say, is stronger than it's ever been. 
Not as strong as it was before this incident, but stronger than it's ever been. Because through this period of counseling, through this period of, of trial for them, they had to basically lay it all on the table. He had to come clean with everything that he had ever done. It's not a process that's necessarily enjoyable, but it's something they went through. And not only that, but every person whose life they had influence on, they also went to and talked about this situation. They asked for forgiveness. They asked if they could possibly um, explain anything to them or talk to them to help them make sense and walk through this situation. So it's incredible because when it first came out, the news obviously devastated many. But to see where their marriage is at today is at a place that it's never been. Now, there's another person, ironically, um, from the same church who is having a difficult time with their marriage as well. Um, and, and after approximately 10 years, I think, uh, this couple decided to end their marriage. Um, they did not do the work. They decided to end their marriage. And look, it wasn't a good marriage. It wasn't an easy marriage. I would say that there was um, some... Indiscretion is not the word I'm looking for, but the word I'm looking for is they both didn't treat each other with a whole lot of respect to begin with. Um, but they, uh, they decided to, to not do the work and make it work. And, and so one of the spouse left, found somebody else, um, lives with that person in what we would call an alternative lifestyle in, in our uh, social, politically correct world. And if you would talk to them today, they would tell you they're as happy as they have ever been that life is good, that God is good, and that this is the best thing for them. They would tell you that. They would explain it to you many times over. And when I look at the two instances that I just gave you, those two very different situations, both people would tell you that this is where they should be and this is where God wants them to be, and it's as happy as they've ever been in their relationships. So what's the difference? What is the difference that I see. The difference that I see is in the first instance, the person did the hard work of working at it, but not only just working at it with their spouse, working at it with everybody they knew. Can you forgive me for what I've done? I'm confessing this to you. I'm bringing this to you. The second example, the person didn't do any of that. In fact, what they would tell you is something along the lines of, if you don't support me, then you don't really love me. You need to be more tolerant. I know these are phrases that are thrown around, so I don't want you to start politically thinking a certain way or socially thinking a certain way, but they equate it with your support, with their love over any decision they've ever made. And they're two very different things. I think we know that, right? You have to go through the bad sometimes to get to the good. The figurative fires that we face in our lives are going to do one of two things, right? They're either going to melt us and burn us, or they're going to refine us. How we react in faith to those situations goes a long part, plays a long, goes a long way into how that outcome is. Charles Spurgeon, the famed theologian, says this, Repentance is as much a mark of a Christian as faith is. A very little sin, as the world calls it, is a very great sin to a true Christian. How do you view repentance in your life? Now, let's be honest. I, I pray that you've heard of this concept, this word before. It's a, it's a big type of Christianese type word, you would say. And we don't talk about it all the time, but I think it's of the utmost importance. But a lot of churches and a lot of pastors, look, if, if you're anything like me, this is something, this is a sermon I would have heard growing up all the time. Repent, 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 repent. And it just gets beaten into you. And so when you grow up, you kind of it's not that you shy away from it, but you go, we don't need to hear about repentance every other week. But I think we've probably gone too far the other direction, and maybe we need to talk about repentance in our lives a little bit more. And that's where we're at today. That's why this is a sermon that even if you don't think you need to hear it, you need to hear it. But it won't be the greatest feel-good message you've ever heard. Because it's not popular in our day and age to talk about this. Why? Because it deals very heavily with the issue of sin in your lives. And if you're sitting there thinking right now, you know what, Scott? I really need to hear this. Good. You're right. You do. And if you're sitting there thinking right now, Scott, I really don't need to hear this. Guess what? You need to hear it even more. Right? Because we all sin. When people hear about repentance, oftentimes we internalize and we think about, not of repentance on our part, but we think about judgment from God. 
If that's where you're at right now, I'm going to read a quote by an author and pastor, Timothy Keller, because I think he nails on the head. This is good stuff. In religion, our only hope is to live a good life. Let me, let me, let me, let me emphasize one word. In religion, our only hope is to, to live a life good enough to require God to bless us. So every instance of sin and repentance is therefore traumatic, unnatural, and threatening. Only under great duress do religious people admit they have sinned. Because their only hope is their moral goodness. In the gospel, the knowledge of our acceptance in Christ makes it easier to admit that we are flawed. Because we know we won't be cast off if we confess the true depths of our sinfulness. Our hope is in Christ's righteousness, not our own. So it's not as traumatic to admit our weaknesses and our lapses. Much like Keller, I must ask you this morning... Is your faith a religion or is your faith in Jesus? Because they're two very different things. That's why it's necessary to talk about this today. Think about it. When John the Baptist showed up on the scene, what was his message? Book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John the Baptist, that was what he preached when he was out in the desert and people came. That's what they heard. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John the Baptist, sent to make straight the path for the Lord. Sent to prepare the hearts and the minds of those who would hear the coming Messiah. That's what he was meant to do. And what was his word? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That was his message. That was his words. Utmost importance. Should it be for us? Absolutely. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Scott, we're talking about discipleship. How does this work in discipleship? And for those of you who don't know, we're working through a seven-week series on discipleship. This is week five. You got two more left. Then Bishop Bob will be speaking the last Sunday in the month. I want to stress to you that discipleship is impossible without the practice of repentance in your life. You cannot be a disciple of Christ and not have the act of ongoing repentance in your life. The two do not mix. Let me give you a great example found in the Bible. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Okay? If you'd open up your Bible there, and you don't have to, but if you would, if, you, if it's anything like my Bible, you'd open it up and you'd see the title, Jesus Anointed by a Sinful Woman. And it's kind of fascinating if you think about it. Technically, every instance in the Bible that doesn't account what Jesus could say, a sinful man or a sinful woman, right? But it's Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. So here's what happens. Jesus gets invited to the home of a Pharisee, of a religious leader. And it says Jesus was basically lounging at the table. So if you can imagine Jesus kicking it back at the table, he's lounging there. And it says a woman came up. And we know that this woman would have probably heard him preach earlier, and she would have accepted his message. And so she was crying tears of joy at the feet of Christ. In fact, Scripture says that she cried so much that her tears covered the feet of Christ. At which point she then in turn took her hair and wiped the feet of Christ dry from her tears with her hair. After that, Scripture says she got in an alabaster jar of perfume, poured it on the feet of Christ, as an anointing to him. And at this point, the Pharisees thought to themselves, if he only knew what type of sinner this woman was and who was anointing his feet, then he would have nothing to do with her. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, basically said to them, he said to the Pharisees, I want to talk to you about something. So I'm going to give an example. Two people owed a money letter some money. One of them owed him 50 denarii, another 500 denarii. Let's make it into real life examples. Some people owed the bank a lot of money. One person owed the bank $10,000. The other person owed the bank a million dollars. The bank chose to forgive both of those debts. The money lender chose to forgive both of the debts. Now, which of them do you think was more grateful? The Pharisee said, well, I would think that it would be the person who owed the larger sum of money. Christ said, you are correct. You have chosen correctly. That's exactly right. The person who had the larger sum of money owned forgave more. And then he says to him, look, Simon, 
the Pharisee, says, Simon, since I came into your house, you didn't have any water for my feet. That was customary at the time. People's feet got dirty. When you went to somebody's house, especially somebody of wealth or authority or position, you would wash your feet. Ever since I came to my house, you had no water for me to wash my feet, but this woman washed my feet with her tears. You did not provide me with a towel to dry my feet. She dried it with her hair. You did not provide oil for my head, but she anointed my feet with oil. And he turns to the woman and he says... Your sins are forgiven. Which is why she was there. And of course the Pharisee says, Who is this to forgive the sins? And then he looks at the woman and he says, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now why do I bring that story up? Because the woman didn't care about everybody else there. Who did she care about? Jesus. Now, do you think this woman, who is called a sinful woman, who is known as a sinful woman in the community, would have had any idea what the Pharisees were thinking about her, or would have been thinking under their breath, or talking about her, or thinking under their breath, thinking in their heads about her? She knew exactly what was going through their mind. How dare this woman, a sinner, a prostitute, come and do this at the feet of Christ? She knew she was being judged. She knew what was going to be out there. And guess what? She didn't care. She didn't care about what they thought. She didn't care about how they viewed her. What did she care about? She cared about Christ. What do you care about? I bring this up because if you're anything like me, oftentimes we take the opinions of others much greater importance than we should, especially in relation to the opinion of Christ. We think to ourselves, boy, I would love to repent, I would love to talk about this stuff, and I would love to go forward, and I'd love to be at the altar, but what will people think of me? Really? You're worried about what people think of you? And I'm speaking to myself as much as I am you right now. You're worried about what people think of you more than the Almighty God, Savior of your soul, the one who has the ability to send you to heaven or to hell? It's insane. It's complete insanity, but isn't that how the devil works? If we can get you to back down or sit in your pew or stay comfortable, don't do anything too crazy, then we can keep you thinking that you're a good person without this practice of repentance in your life. Philip Yancey says this, he says, Repentance, not proper behavior or even holiness, is the doorway to grace. And the opposite of sin is grace, not virtue. So I ask, how are you? Are you genuinely repentant in your faith? Do you sorrowfully repent of your sins in your life? And I use this word sorrow and sorrowfully in a very intentional way this morning. I use it the reason, for the same reasons that Paul does it. What does Paul say in verses 9 and 10? For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. It's not just about having godly sorrow. It's what that godly sorrow does to you and within you. You see, repentance is one of your building, the building blocks of your faith. Without repentance, there is no need for forgiveness. Without forgiveness, there is no need for Christ. And without Christ, there is no need for salvation because you can do it all on your own. Do you see the road that that leads you down? So how do we determine if somebody is sorrowfully repentant or if they are being worldly repentant. The Bible gives us two more great examples of this. Both of them found in the Old Testament. Two kings confronted by two prophets in two books of the Bible, First and Second Samuel. In the book of First Samuel, chapter 15, there's a king. His name is Saul. Saul is the first king of the nation of Israel. And Saul has a meeting with Samuel. Samuel is the head pastor, the head leader, the head prophet of the nation of Israel. And Saul meets with, Samuel meets with Saul, and Samuel imparts the word of the Lord to Saul. He says, look, I want you to go to the Amalekites and kill them all. Well, if that don't get your attention, nothing will this morning. But that's basically what he says. I want you to drive them off the face of the earth. The Amalekites are evil. They will not listen to me. They will not obey me. I don't want you to just kill the warriors. I want you to kill the king. I want you to kill the women. I want you to kill the children. I want you to kill the livestock. I want you to kill every living thing in that nation. And Samuel's word to Saul I know it's not fun, but that's the word that was given. So let's read through. You don't have to to turn there, but listen. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Here's what Saul does. 
Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. The two verses, the three verses I just read you, were those Samuel's instructions to Saul? Not even close. The instructions were, go destroy everything. Saul kept the king of the nation that he just conquered alive, along with the best of their livestock. And it's almost humorous because God sends Samuel to confront Saul on this. And Samuel goes up, and as Samuel's approaching, you know what Saul says? Look what I've done. I've done what God has told me to do. As there is literally livestock making noises in the background. Can you imagine being Samuel? Like, are you out of your mind? How stupid do you think I am, right? He says, Saul, you have not obeyed God. You have not listened to God. This is not what God commanded you. This is not what God asked of you. You were told and instructed to destroy every living thing. And when he confronts Saul about this, what is Saul's response? Saul says, I have sinned. And then Samuel goes on his response, which, which holds the famous words you've heard it before, to obey is better than sacrifice and things of that nature. But then after Samuel is done reprimanding Saul, you know what Saul says? I have sinned. After he says, I have sinned, he says, but Samuel, I want you to go back to the nation with me so that you can present me before the elders and the people in God's sight. Basically saying, I want you to go back with me and kind of build me up lift me up a little bit so that people can see all the good stuff that I've done here. Do you think that's the reaction God was looking for? Compare that and contrast that with 2 Samuel chapter 12. There's a guy named King David. King David took over after King Saul. Many of us know the transgressions of King David's reign. Bathsheba, her husband, getting her pregnant, having her husband killed, covering the whole thing up, and the prophet Nathan approaches Daniel. And he gives him, sorry, Daniel, approaches David. And he gives him an example, right? And he says, Which, what should happen to the bad person in this story? And David says, well, we should get rid of him, kill him. And Nathan says, that person is you, David. That person is you. You're the one who did this. And what is David's response? David's response is very similar to what Saul's is. David says, I have sinned against the Lord. But how were the actions different after that? Because after Saul was confronted by Samuel, again, he asked him to go back with him and build him up. What was David's response? David spent the next seven days on his knees, pleading with God for the life of his son. Seven days. No food. No water. No attendance. Just David and God. Saul said, I have sinned. David said, I have sinned against God. Two similar situations going in very different directions. In fact, David writes in the book of Psalm, chapter 51, he says this, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And then he goes on in that same chapter to say, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. There is no selfishness in David's words. He was a broken man. A lot different than the, what we, the picture that we are painted of Saul. So what exactly is repentance? Here's what repentance is defined as. Sincere regret or remorse. Who showed it more with their words? They both showed it with their words. Who showed it more with their action in their lives? David did. Saul said the words, but his life didn't reflect the words that came out of his mouth. But here in 2 Corinthians, we are writing or we are reading that sorrow leads us to godly repentance. It's right there in verse 9. Because your sorrow led you to repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. So why do I bring that up? I bring it up for a very simple reason. Repentance is not an easy process. Repentance is not a fun process. I would love to stand up front and preach feel-good sermons every week. Nothing would make me happier. I'm a happy guy. I like to make people happy, right? 
but I must preach the word of God. I must give you what is written in this book. By definition, listen to this, by definition, here's repentance. Sincere regret or remorse. Sincere regret or remorse over something. The very definition means that you have done something you wish you hadn't done. I think if I asked for a show of hands, every person in this room would be able to raise their hand and say, I have done something in my life that I wish I hadn't done. And many of us, myself included, would need a lot more than two hands, right? Or even 20 digits. That's fingers and toes. <laughs> Why can't sorrow and growth that leads us to God be a more pleasant process? Because it involves opening the corridors of your heart to God. And it doesn't just involve opening the corridors of your heart to God. It can also involve opening the corridors of your heart to others as well. And that scares the pants off of us, myself included. You see, one of the reasons that people fear and shun the church and the church at large is that unfortunately the church has done itself a pretty poor disservice over the last couple hundred years. See, the church and many people in the church are very good at picking the specks out of other people's eyes. Unfortunately, we're not as good at the, the planks in our own. We tend to ignore them. If I can help you, then I look more godly. If I can help you, then I look like I'm better, and I can just kind of ignore and push down my own sin in my life. Guys, why do you think I found it necessary when we're talking about discipleship to preach about humility before I preach about repentance? It wasn't just an accident. It was on purpose, and if you weren't here three weeks ago, that's when we talked about humility. Because I think humility is one of the building blocks, again, which, of which our faith is built. It's not about, if somebody comes to you to confess a sin, it's not about you to say, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, you really screwed up. Yeah, I'm perfect. Look at me and look at my example. It's up to you to be the love of Christ to them. And maybe that means showing them that. But the attitude is much different. As I mentioned early, that's earlier, that's why for many of us, the fear of reproach from man is much greater than the fear of reproach from God. And so what do we tend to do at that point? We fake it. We fake it. We fake like we have our lives together. We fake the degree of our faith. We fake the assurance that we have from God. And we keep people at arm's length so that we don't have to open up to, our, to them. We don't have to open up to them so that they find out who we are under the surface. They don't find out who we are in our true self. We need to keep their opinions about us good because let's be honest, we live in small town America and everybody knows everybody's business in Clinton County. If there's one thing I've learned over seven and a half years here, it's there is very little that I know that's not already known because just when I think I know something new, everybody else goes, you didn't already know that? No, apparently not. It makes it tough though, doesn't it? Absolutely. Luke chapter five, verses 31 and 32 says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but a sick the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those are the words of Christ. Not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. I have not called, come to call the righteous. I have come to call the sinners to repentance. And just in case you're not sure if this verse applies to you or not, I'm going to throw 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 at you, because think about this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But then it goes on in verse 10 to say what? If we claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, Christ, and his word has no place in our lives. So if you're wondering if this sin thing is about you, yeah, it's about you. Yeah, it's about me. And if you claim otherwise, then the word of Christ has no place in your lives. Pastor Jeremy Taylor says this, it is the greatest and dearest blessing that ever God gave to men that they may repent, and therefore to deny or to delay it is to refuse health when brought by the skill of the physician, to refuse liberty offered to us by our gracious Lord. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Times of refreshing. See, we want the times of refreshing. Don't we? That sounds good. But we don't always want to do the repent aspect of that verse to get there. 
Do you guys get where I'm coming from? I hope you're taking this in. I hope it's making some sense to you. Because this verse, this passage that we're talking about today in 2 Corinthians, doesn't just talk about how God treats us in our relationship with God. It also talks about interpersonal relationships and how we treat others, which is why I brought up that example of the church earlier. Right? Luke chapter 17, verses 3 through 4 says, If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and seven times to come seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, then forgive him. Boy, isn't that tough. The word repent is interesting the way it's put in that verse. It's not only for the forgiveness of our sins. Repentance is important in the relationships with each other. Repentance is important with how we deal with ourselves as a body of Christ. Repentance is important with the interpersonal relationships within this room, with how the church conducts itself. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. It's the basic message that Christ spread when he started his preaching. Anybody know what Christ said when he started preaching according to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17? You've already heard it. He said this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Sound familiar to you? I mentioned it earlier because it's the same words that John the Baptist spoke. In preparing the way for Christ, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Christ comes along, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. I love these words by the pastor A.W. Pink. He says, the Christian who has stopped repenting has stopped growing. The Christian who has stopped repenting has stopped growing. Many of us want to be disciples of Christ. We say we want to be disciples of Christ, and we claim that we want to be disciples of Christ. We want and desire discipleship in our lives, but we do it so often without repentance. So what sin has affected your life that you need to repent of? This is not a question that I hope you hear Pastor Scott asking you. It's a question that I hope the Holy Spirit is pounding into your heart. Because I don't want it to come from me. I'm not trying to guilt you into anything. If I'm trying to guilt you into something, look, I'll guilt my kids into stuff. I'll guilt them into get me something to drink out of the refrigerator. I'll guilt, guilt them into, you know, get me something to eat at supper time or, or, or wiping up something. But I'm not going to guilt you into anything from the pulpit because that's not my job. I'm trying to present the gospel of Christ as I see it interpreted according to the will of God. So if your heart is beating, if you're feeling a pressure, if you're thinking about this repentance thing, I pray that it's not for me, but I pray that it's from God. You see, I had a conversation this week with another, another couple, actually. Um, and the, the conversation wasn't going in this direction, but they felt the need to tell me about their marriage because they had, we had talked about their marriage before. And their marriage had been difficult, and then it had gotten really good, and the last they had told me it was difficult again. And this is in a very short time span. And I know a lot of the issues that are going on underneath the surface, and there's going to be a lot of difficulty for them because they're dealing with a lot of stuff that you and I don't have to. But it was interesting. They said, I want you to know, before you leave, I want you to know that our marriage is doing awesome right now. I said, really? What happened? They said, well, we walked along with this couple at our church. They're an older couple. They've been mentoring us. They've been talking to us. And they walked us through uh, this process of restoring our marriage. And they said, and, and we talked about everything that we had brought to the table before, or so we thought. You see, they had talked about everything between the two of them. But when another couple became involved in their lives and they opened up, they allowed this couple to ask questions that they themselves were not willing to ask. And when that happened, they had to reveal things about themselves that they weren't willing to reveal in a one-on-one -on -one basis. Why do I bring that up? Because you know what I said to them? I said, wow, that wouldn't have been fun at all. That was my wording to them, right? That wouldn't have been fun at all. You know what they said? They said, you're exactly right. It wasn't but it's been awesome ever since. See, because they were willing to do the work and get to that point, their life has flourished together since then. Most of us aren't willing to do the work. And I'm not talking about your marriage. I'm talking about your faith. I'm talking about your relationship with Christ. What were their words? It was so worth it. 
That's what they said. It was so worth it. Repentance and bringing your heart, an open heart, a repentant heart, a heart broken before God is worth it. It is. I'm not saying there's another option. It's worth it. That's not the question. The question is, are you willing to do it? Charles Spurgeon writes this. He said, learn this lesson, not to trust Christ because you repent, but trust Christ to make you repent. Not to come to Christ because you have a broken heart, but to come to him that he may give you a broken heart. Not to come to him because you are fit to come, but come to him because you are unfit to come. Your fitness is your unfitness. Your qualification is your lack of qualification. I bring that up because I think this message is for everyone, no matter where you are at in your spiritual walk with Christ. With that being said, um, I'm going to close in prayer, and then the worship team's going to come up, and we're going to sing. And when they're singing, I will tell you this, that the altar is open. And that's no different than any other Sunday. This altar is always open. And you don't have to come up here to repent. You don't. You can stay in your seats. You can have a conversation with God anywhere you want. But I can tell you this, for almost a fact, not quite a fact, but a strong degree of assurance, that if you don't come up front, that that commitment don't stick near as much. Because there's something about that act of walking in front of people. There's something about that act of letting people see you in your point of brokenness. There's something about that act of vulnerability where you're going, what are they going to be thinking about me? The question is, do you care more about the opinion of man or do you care more about the opinion of God? Because every person in this sin, in this sin, in this room could approach the altar. Everyone. And I'm not trying to pressure you into approaching the altar. What I'm saying is it's open. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. If you need to do business with God, do it. Don't wait. Don't delay because life is short and you don't know. Don't be afraid of man. Be open to what God's willing to do in your life. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. We thank you that we can come to you in repentance and you will not turn us away. God, so often what we think makes us qualified is what makes us unqualified before you. May our hearts be broken by your spirit today, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And may we feel and experience your love and your acceptance when we do come to you with an open heart and a broken heart. God, for the sin that exists in our lives that we are not willing to admit, may your spirit make it open and make us willing to go there. And may we honor you in all we do. We ask these things in Christ's name.